gonna start. Hello everyone, thank you for joining uh, us for the webinar of the Media Education Lab, among a lot of other webinars. This is a little bit unusual webinar, which I decided to offer this weekend after um, more than a week that the conflict in uh, Gaza and Israel um, escalated than the usual. This is, I don't want to sound like if it's like just this incident, so definitely it's something that is reoccurring as an Israeli. Uh, I've been witness to a lot of different violence um, cycles over my 45 years. Um, and um, this really obviously hit it home, but also I felt an obligation as a media educator to uh, untangle and kind of help talk about it in the classroom. And this morning I did it in my own undergraduate classroom, which was um, a very, you know, civilized discussion, but there's a lot of different emotions. There's a lot of different perspectives and, it's uh, like a hot potato in the sense of like, how do I even bring it to my class? And what I want to offer here is not my personal perspective. I can talk for hours about what are my thoughts and I'm a nonviolent um, trainer and I'm looking at the violence and the cruelty and all those deaths that are done in a very horrible way. Um, but what I want to offer here is how we as media educator can look at what the media is telling us and having the students discussing what they're feeling, how they're approaching it. We had the whole discussion in class of like the verification uh, with um, what's going on. They're asking me about the bombing in the hospital as if, you know, I'm a very viable source that I know. And I said, you know, there is the Israeli army that says that. There is the Palestinian Authority that says that. There is the Washington Post doesn't know. It says here and there. So uh, I don't have a definite answer. And I explained how I go and do my own personal kind of fact checking. But this is really not a fact checking webinar. Uh, this is really about how to bring those topics to the classroom and have a civilized discussion, but a very difficult discussion uh, with our students. And I'm going to share with you some resources. We're going to, I'll give you some kind of uh, intro. We're sharing some uh, media. Then we're going to analyze it as a group. We're going to go to a breakout room to practice that. And then we're going to come back to kind of like talk about that. Um, the first thing that I want us to start as, again, nonviolence, which is to share uh, an observation and then to share our feelings and needs. Um, I want people in one word um, to share in the chat where they're at now. Just one word, it can be a feeling, it can be a need, it can be physical state. Where are you at? I'm personally exhausted, but that's also because I woke up so early um, and had to teach uh, very early, but also from all the time reading the news. Um, so my word would be really exhausted from trying to keep up and trying to like digest this atrocity that are happening on a daily basis. Um, okay, I appreciate all the, does anybody um, want to share more than the word and kind of bring us into like where they're at right now and what, before we delve into the actual media texts? Um, well, it's just really hard to know what to think, you know, I mean, there, there's so many awful things going on all over. It's like, I don't, you know, I, I just don't know how to think about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori. Mark? Yeah, I, I think um, as a parent, and I think just as a human being, you know, the suffering and the, and the uh, violence that you're seeing it's it's inexplicable to um, to our children and, and to our families. And so when you see this, and um, it doesn't matter whose side it is, you know, just the idea that somebody's family is grieving and doesn't have the answers um, about the whereabouts of, of their family, as well as the the incredible loss of life, you're just really heartbroken and don't have the uh, the words to really manufacture a, a good answer. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else wants to share? Okay. 
So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to walk through different like things. I welcome um, any comment, any discussion, anything that you would like to um, um, to add to it. Uh, just remember, people have obviously a different perspective, different emotional state that they're at. I'm asking people to be respectful. Uh, this is a place that I want us to be able to uh, share where we're at uh, without judgment and with the ability to be able to share because people are in different places and feeling different things and have uh, each one uh, their perspective about it. And that's how I want to do this discussion. So I'm going to start with uh, sharing my screen and interesting. Thank you, Zoom, to not allowing me to share it the way that I wanted. Um, <laughs> okay, I wonder which Zoom do you, no, not the whiteboard, great. Okay, and here we go with sharing issues. Okay, let's try now. Do you see the Media Education Lab? Yes. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm the co-director of the Media Education Lab. This is a platform that have a lot of resources. Our website is going to change in three weeks, but uh, to more showcase what we have. But under teaching resources, you can find some of the stuff that I'm talking about. And our event, you can see here, this is the event today. There's going to be the recording beneath that. So you're welcome to, you know, um, go there and I'll put it uh, in the chat uh, later. Just going to open the chat so I can uh, look if people are typing stuff. Okay. So um, I want to start, first of all, with um, a horrible reality, especially like I'm in Chicago and in Illinois, uh, the death of uh, Wadia El Fayomi is, besides obviously that it's horrible why a six-year-old needs to be murdered, uh, but it showcased the importance of the work of media educators. We can see that his crime was for the person who murdered him, his landlord who was 71, was that he saw him as a threat because he knew he was Palestinian. And that's obviously, there is the different things that this murder is thinking, but it's also about how to deconstruct media messages and understand from the messages and what comes from the TV and how is that bringing somebody obviously not everybody who's seeing the TV messages becoming a murderer, like you need also different personality things, but there is a horrible effect that is happening. And that's where in the classroom, we also need to think about how do we talk about those things? What do we cultivate? What's happening? Um, and how do we talk about those media messages? Um, and what is age appropriate? What I'm gonna talk about would be more appropriate for high school. Uh, maybe some middle school, but definitely not elementary school. Uh, this is a whole different discussion. I wouldn't share some of the things that I'm sharing with you. High school, I'm a former high school teacher. I would definitely do that. But uh, just to put things in uh, perspective. So I want to start with this interesting uh, post that I saw from my friend Faith Rogo, who, um, like me, is a Sesame Street um kind of fan, uh, to be nice to call it that way. But you can see here, uh, and that was from a week ago. So uh, pretty much in the beginning, you can see the way that um, Sesame Street is addressing that. And that's when I'm talking about age appropriate. Here is a way to um, think about it. They're talking about the kids. They're talking about like a safe and free from violence and terror, which is a way not to go into like the conflict, who is right, who is to blame, whose number have more and what, and getting into all the difficult things about occupation, liberation, is it a terrorist uh, group, the Hamas or not? 
So this is a way to get to the humanity and talking about it. At the same time, people will criticize it that it's uh, very shallow in that sense and not delving into all the, the issues of the conflict. But given that it's Sesame Street, right, and their target audience are parents uh, of little kids, it seems to be appropriate. From here, I want to move to a very similar um, message, but very not age appropriate for uh, elementary. And if you've seen it, you'll see it again, but to share with you the cold opening of uh, SNL. And let me know if you heard, you hear the sound. This week, we saw the horrible images and stories from Israel and Gaza. And I know what you're thinking, who better to comment on it than Pete Davidson? <laughs> well, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, I am a good person to talk about it because when I was seven years old, uh, my dad was killed in a terrorist attack. So I know something about what that's like. Um, I saw so many terrible pictures this week of children suffering, uh, Israeli children and Palestinian children. And uh, it took me back to a really horrible, horrible place. And, um, you know, no one in this world deserves to suffer like that, you know, especially not kids, you know. Um, after my dad died, my mom tried uh, pretty much everything she could do to cheer me up. I remember one day when I was eight, uh, she got me what she thought was a Disney movie, uh, but it was actually the Eddie Murphy stand-up special, Delirious. <laughs> Uh, and we played it in the car on the way home, and, and when she heard the things Eddie Murphy was saying, uh, she tried to take it away. Um, but then she noticed something. Uh, for the first time in, in a long time, I, I was laughing again. Um, I don't understand it. I, I really don't, and I never will, but sometimes comedy is really the only way forward through tragedy. Um, you know, my heart is with everyone whose lives have been destroyed uh, this week. Um, but tonight, I'm going to do what I've always done in the face of tragedy, and that's try to be funny. Um, remember, I said try. <laughs> and live from New York, it's Saturday night. So some people praise it, some people didn't. And I'm curious if you want to share your thoughts. We're going to do an analysis on other media parts, but here to share your thoughts about it. It's a very interesting piece, and there's a lot to untangle. It's only less than two minutes, but there's so many cultural references here and so many different nuances. Um, and I'm talking especially to the U.S. audience. Like, in Israel, it will be a whole different presentation that I uh, would do, and in Palestine, it would be a different presentation that I would do. But here for U.S. audience, it's very interesting the connection that uh, Pete Davidson did. And I wonder, what do you think about it? And what are people's thoughts? And a lot of people felt inspired and were celebrating SNL to start not in a comedy, but in a comment that is so sensitive. But at the same time, there was other criticism. And I'm wondering how people are feeling about this. And this is like a conversation that can be done like in the classroom over this two minute opening of SNL. So I'm inviting, you can write in the chat if you don't want to, um, to talk. But if somebody wants to uh, share their thoughts about this piece, I'm eager to hear what are people thinking about it. Hi, Yanti. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. Um, I'm in New York. So um, my very first day of uh, teaching high school was 9-11. And I remember it. So when I saw this piece, um, I'd seen it before the Pete Davidson opening. I was just... I was really amazed and touched and um, I needed to hear him. I needed to hear him say that. And I'm really shocked. I did not know that there was negative responses to it. I didn't know that. So I'd be curious to hear what people had to say about it. I and thought it was authentic. Yeah, thank you Gretchen for sharing. Um... And I see Caroline and Elizabeth are adding in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. Yes, the word terrorist, obviously, because some people look at Hamas as liberators. 
um, against the occupation um, of Palestine. Um, part of it was the connection to 9-11 because a lot of Israelis have said this is uh, the Israeli 9-11. And talking about it, it's really interesting because what came after 9-11 and is that what the Israeli are trying to do, right? And uh, and looking at those connections, and is it really um, should be connected those two? And he was talking about uh, kids suffering. At the end, he said their life has been destroyed, but he's not. He's empathizing, but he's not exactly talking about all the stuff that are going. Um, Um, you know, I am just talking for myself and my circle of friends who I, I have a lot of Jewish friends and they're devastated. They're absolutely devastated by this. And I want to show support for them, but I also feel empathy for the Palestinians. This has been going on for a long time. And, um, you know, I so that's why I said I didn't know how to think. I don't know how to approach this, but it makes sense to 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 approach it from a children and family perspective it's horrible what each side is going through yes and again i mean i as i said i personally sense i'm israeli uh uh there's a lot of context here that i'm going to add in, in the next things that i'm going to work on but this is really like a, a a difficult time and and way of like how to approach what to say and i always use my humanistic values that you know a person is a person uh, and I don't want people to die. And uh, whatever is the excuse, I don't accept that. Uh, to murder, to kill, to... But that's that's my own uh, perspective, not like every person agree with that. Um, thank you, everybody, to, to write in the chat. I cannot like read everything, but if somebody wants to comment or to add to what they're writing or to comment about something that another person wrote there... Um, I thought it kind of, in a way, it, it it trivialized the the whole event. You know, it's it's a comedy show. I mean, what else are you going to do with it? And I just, I just wasn't that impressed. wasn't that impressed by it. Although I do appreciate his perspective on it. Yeah, I mean, it was a brilliant move of SNL to start like that, to say, we acknowledge that there is something happening right now. We're a comedy show and this is what we're doing and using Pete Davidson personal stories to justify the comedy that will come after uh, in that sense. And again, I mean, you can look at the different um, comments online and, and Gretchen, like part of the thing maybe is, and we're gonna do it later, is to go over comments. I sometimes appalled by comments, but it's very helpful to understand some of the things of empathizing with people who think differently and to understand how people might interpret messages in a different way. And in that sense, social media gave us a lot of that in the good and the bad way. Uh, but that's a way to really read. But as a teacher, what I do, I curate those uh, in the sense of like, I go over it. I'm not like just opening it and being surprised because then I'm underprepared. I'm going over those reaction, curate, look at them, and then choose which one so that I know it's appropriate for my students. Uh, when I'm talking about K-12, undergrad is a different story and graduate students. Um, anything else before I continue? Any other thing to share about the SNL opening? Okay. So... I'm gonna to move to something that I'm teaching over um, data storytelling and visual strategy, and it's about maps. And although I'm gonna talk about maps and territory, I want to emphasize that from my point of view and my experience, this conflict is way beyond just territory. And if people are thinking that it's only about territory, this is really simplifying the conflict between the Palestinian, the Arab world, the Jewish, the Israeli. Uh, this is much more complex and nuanced. And um, to live there and to see how it works and what the territory is gives you much more nuanced understanding. So although I'm going to talk about territory right now, I want to make sure that it's understood that that's, the conflict is much greater than that. Um, 
just making sure you can see my uh, the map here of Gaza. Okay. So I took this from Wikipedia, which I know that a lot of teachers are horrified to look at Wikipedia as a reliable source. But I have my students using Wikipedia because I'm explaining to them that a lot of people are editing and they can also go on the backwards and see like who modify the files and stuff. So there is a transparency that in an encyclopedia you don't have a lot of the time. So I'm not saying it's the best resource always, but it's a go-to a lot of the time for people to see. And this is actually a map that I want to share that is actually accurate in the sense of like showing you what happened uh, on October 7th to show how small uh, is the Gaza Strip. And when the Israeli asked the Palestinians to move from Gaza into the south toward the Egypt border, it's not like a huge amount. And it's kind of, you know, we can talk about different ways of why was it done and how is that affecting but this map, as you see, the orange is where the Hamas went out um, and uh, started to go into like different um, um, uh, villages, kibbutz, uh, cities in Israel, and where the the army stopped them and then started to to move them uh, back or to fight back. So this is like one of maps that you can see and. Again, to understand the whole thing, you really need to understand, like I visited, I've been there, I, I know what this stands, but when it's just a part of land that you've never been there and to understand the proportions and how far, this is really, Gaza is a very tiny like strip and to understand that there's a border of Egypt and there's only two entrances. I mean, there's the sea, but there's only one entrance here from Egypt and one entrance here to Israel, basically. And everything else has the fence that have been kind of destroyed and rebuilt now um, to keep the Palestinians uh, of Gaza uh, there. Um, so that's like one map that, again, you can look at it and you can explain how is it, why are the colors chosen? Again, demystifying it from a, a media literacy perspective. What I wanted to share with you is also some other resources as I was looking and preparing that are very interesting to curate and really look from a media literacy perspective, what is going on there? So looking here, this is a map that Al Jazeera, and I'll talk uh, soon about Al Jazeera, an interesting map that shows you the Palestinian and Israeli conflict from 1917 to 1995, to try to explain how the Israeli occupied um, um, the West Bank, Gaza, and after the Oslo Accords, how the Palestinian territory shrinked dramatically and the, uh, the Palestinian are under siege. Now, there are from my education, which I know it's Israeli, so I drank from the Kool-Aid of the Israeli government textbooks, so I am aware of that. Uh, but what's interesting is that here it says Jewish control and it says pre-British mandate, which is true because the British mandate only came after the World War, the First World War when they conquered it. But for 400 years, it was under Turkish government. So it was not really Jewish control and it was not really Palestinian control. It was Turkish, but that has been omitted here, interestingly enough, to say that all the green has been Palestinian. Now, obviously, that would be what the Israeli would claim about this map that doesn't represent what's happening there. Uh, and then they have been under the British mandate, they have been another map that it doesn't exist here where the United Nation offered to divide the country in a fair as much as it was fair, it was more Western kind of perspective into a Palestinian and Jewish uh, countries. But that was rejected uh, by the Arab world. And so in 48, after a war of the 48, those were the boundaries that then you can see how it changed with the occupation that belonged to Jordan, this part, and this part belonged to Egypt. And then in 68, they were conquered by Israel and then occupied under Israel territory that then here with settlements and other in the accord, it became this shrinking kind of land. So the thing is that Al Jazeera obviously have their own kind of way are showing maps 
but they're missing omitting some information, redesigning some information to show basically how Palestinians have a lot of uh, land and suddenly it shrank. It's not totally not true, but there's missing so many like things from history that makes you read it in a way that is problematic. And I'm aware that I'm biased in my reading of it. So I welcome other readings uh, of people to challenge the way that I was educated about. So again, this is like one example. An interesting thing that I found also was this map that shows you here how many missiles are being thrown from the Gaza Strip into Israel versus the strikes that the Israeli army is doing into Gaza. Now, it's interestingly that they're trying to make it as proportionate the two when we know that there is the Iron Dome here that can like detect some. But when I'm asking my parents who see all those, there's this morning uh, who see those missiles above their houses, they're saying, yeah, it's like fireworks and stuff. And I'm like, this is not normal situation. Like, uh, but because of the Iron Dome, the Israeli feel a little bit safer, but still people are being killed from those missiles. But if you look, and there's a description about the history and what happened here. And, but when I go up, and on purposely I uh, hide it, you can see that this is from 2014 and not from now. So they don't, this article, it's not like fake news that they're trying to show it. But when you go and look at the Gaza-Israeli conflict, you get to this one, but you need to be careful to see, oh, this is, something from nine years ago. And here we are now. So this is not new. And that's an interesting thing to read and to educate yourself about, oh, okay. So this has been going on for quite a while. So those are kind of examples. And, and the last um, example I want to share with you, which is also fascinating, is this research from Arab Reform Initiative. And the researcher here, uh, Tala Majur, uh, compare the coverage of Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya. Anybody heard about those two networks? Are you familiar with those? Okay, thank you. So what's interesting is that those two network, and she keeps explaining it, it's how they're covering it on Twitter, the conflict. But what's interesting is that she described Al Jazeera is backed up um, by... Um, Kuwait, I want to make sure I'm correct. Um, da, 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 da. Qatar, sorry. So you can see here the story that Al Jazeera has been created to back up the Emir of Qatar, which has different like views than Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And as a response to the success of Al Jazeera, what happened was that uh, Saudi Arabia created El Arabiya. So you have two um, uh, English speaking Arabic station. They also speak in Arabic, but they do have like English speaking, like, um, I don't know, branch, let's call it. But they're representing the ideology of two different branch. And so when you're looking at it and thinking that, oh, they're all the same. No, they're not. And this examination, and I'll put all the links in the uh, event so you can uh, go back and, and see them for yourself. It's very interesting to see. You can hear she explained the methodology and like how things have been shared in what way. It's a very methodological like research that shows you the differences of reporting about it and what are the biases of each one of those two media which can help you to be more informed about the coverage. Cause we like, you know, and I'm guilty of it, uh, looking Washington Post, New York Times. Yes, there's some differences, but at the end it would be kind of the same sources that they're using. But if you go to Al Arabiya and you go to Al Jazeera, you get a whole different perspective, which is very difficult for me during those times to look at, but I'm forcing myself to really understand and empathize and understand the other perspective to look at and try to challenge what I grew up with and what kind of knowledge I have. Doesn't mean that I agree with, but at least to educate myself into what is the other perspective. So again, it's an interesting, can be a discussion and can be something to, to share with and to look at it. 
what I want us to do is to use what we use at the Media Education Lab as we call it the uh, media literacy uh, remote. Uh, it was the remote control, became the smartphone. And maybe thanks to Mark, it's going to be the disc soon. So we're looking forward to the disc edition of it. But we have basically five questions. There is another, you can turn it and then um, there is, and the resource exists on the Media Education Lab. Again, I'll put the link uh, for that. But those five questions are really important. Those are the critical media literacy questions to really understand who is the author and what was the purpose because everybody has their own subjectivity and biases. So what was the purpose of this media? What are the techniques that they use to attract your attention? What are the value, lifestyle, and point of view that are represented? How might different people interpret it differently? And then what is omitted from the message? Um, and that's kind of go through all the analysis that I did today. I covered those questions in different ways. So this very small guide, it's several pages, um, is teaching you how to use it. And that's again on our website. So you're welcome to use it. Um, no problem, Elizabeth. Thank you for joining us. Um, I saw this interesting, so I'll, I'll magnify it. My initial thought was like, wow, okay. I'm personally not the biggest fan of Netanyahu, to say the least. And uh, I'm trying to see the human side on, on each one. And so initially, it's like, okay, that's, you know, a humanistic view of what's happening. But if you start to look at the comments on the right, you can see very interesting that answering the question, and that goes back to my um, thing about read the comments to see how my pe different people interpret it differently. And it's fascinating to see that both sides here are criticizing this as a very shallow and not representing the conflict uh, well, which I don't think was the purpose of the person who did the caricature, right? The Rogers. Um, the idea was to explain that there is a difference. The message, I think, was to say that the people who are suffering are not representing their government. And the fact that the government has their own interest to keep this war for whatever their interests are, if it's financial, if it's power, uh, are not actually representing the people. But people on Twitter or former Twitter, X now, uh, look at it in very different ways. And I was fascinated. I'm just going to scroll a little bit so you can see like different like up and you can read it. Can you read it or is it too small? Oh. I'm, so it's I'm, fascinating. Yeah. I'm caught. I'm taking pictures of it and blowing it up on my phone. Okay. I, and again, I'll, I'll share the, the links. If you want, I can here, I can put the link for this here on the chat so you can look on your computer and kind of um, look at the comments. So again, I mean, we can definitely go and analyze this um, image. Uh, but for me, answering how my different people interpret the message differently, really share like how the different perspective, what people are saying that is omitted, what people are saying, the technique that he used and disagreeing with those technique of the drawing and the focus that they're putting in. Uh, people don't like the comparison uh, between Hamas and uh, Netanyahu. And there's different criticism that uh, are very interesting to understand how this is so difficult to demystify. And I don't think as educator, you need to demystify the conflict. This is like, you're not a political kind of scholar that did research for 20 years about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You're a teacher that is in the classroom and you need to support your students that are feeling confused. You know, all the feeling that you shared um, that don't know and just have people see that there's different perspective on it, that people uh, address it differently, that there's different way of dealing with it and what are the way uh, for them to understand and having them have the structure of the five critical questions to go over it. So what I was planning is to have, um, to have us go to breakout rooms uh, and basically use this link that I put and go through the five critical questions is that okay with everybody? Okay, so I'll give you 15 minutes and then we'll have like five minutes to, and I have a short clip that I want to share to finish on a 
as much as positive note that is possible under those circumstances. Um, okay, so I'm gonna put uh, breakout rooms uh, and okay, and here we go. See you in 15 minutes. Okay, welcome back. I know that when people are joining the, like at the last second, I give 60 seconds, it's a good thing. It means that you had good conversation. So, yes. Uh, when you use this framework in the classroom, do you spend, uh, like for instance, some questions felt less relevant to that media message, like who the author is, is a, you know, a retweet, uh, like, do you spend the same amount of time no. on each one of them, or do you no. focus more? Because the first, the first question is pretty straightforward, but it sets the tone. Okay. So understanding that the author is somebody who's doing a caricature, and what other caricature the person did kind of help you understand where this person is coming from. But that's usually the easiest and kind of, sometimes you cannot know who's the author, so it takes some investigation. But usually it's pretty kind of straightforward. The techniques, I'm saying to my students, there's like 100 techniques that we can, hours, I'm going to give you three, okay? So who is the first one to give me the first three techniques? And then they're kind of, you know, giving it. And it's like, there's many more, but we're moving on because it's not the most crucial thing at this point. Gotcha. Then values, it's very difficult because with students, I'm always defined values. And like, how do you explain what are and what is the difference between values and lifestyle? And then different point of view. Is the actor has point of view? Is the, the director has point of view? Are the people depicted in the picture have point of view that is like, there's several point of view. So that's a big one. Then how might people interpret it differently? That's usually everybody's silent. Nobody knows. And then I'm starting to bring my uh, deceased grandma and say, what would my grandma said? Like, you know, and what this person who doesn't speak English would say, and I'm bringing my kids, what my five-year-old kid would say. And suddenly they're opening their eyes to, oh, there's people who don't speak English that might not understand and just see the, the moving and will interpret it differently. And so that opens up a little bit, but it's a very difficult one. And then the omitted, total silence, because it's so difficult to think about what's not there, right? But that opens up to the biases and that opens up also to talk about who's the act. So there is a six questions that I add to my class, which is who's the target audience and who the intended audience and who is the actual audience. And to explain to them that that's not the same thing, that the person might wanted to have it targeted to this audience, but actually because it's on YouTube, everybody who speaks English and not English can see it. And then the actual audience is completely different. And so that can get into conversation. So I hope that helps. No, they're not accurately like each one the same. And it depends on the age. I did it with kindergartens and I did it with PhD students. So those questions are framed in a way that it's really age appropriate to any age. But the way that you develop those discussions is really according to how deep you want to get. And there can be a very deep discussion. So thank you for asking that. I really appreciate it. Um, I want Yanti, to add if, the four if I could just add one thing. Yes, please. I just want to say that those two questions that you add in about audience are very important to students because when I've asked that, they always say everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's an uh, interesting conversation to have if we help them to understand that not every media message is meant to be aimed at every single person and then you can narrow it down to their own culture and their own text and it helps them to see that they have a specific uh, world view culturally as youth and that helps them to understand more about what they are seeing for text. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, this is a very important. What I do with undergrad, I don't know if for high school students that would be appropriate, but what I do in my media literacy class, there's a class about consumer trends and I'm going to Mintel as one of the like platform and show them how marketers 
are basically dividing the whole US population into 49 categories that everyone would fall into it and showing them like how they're being defined. And they're like, what? And saying, yes, this is how marketing works. And there's never advertising to everybody. There's always very specific target audience. And that's part of the media literacy to demystify. So thank you, Carolyn. It's a very good comment that I forgot to, to say. Um, other, before we end on the video that I want to share with you, and I'll explain to you why I chose this video specifically. Um, any other comments about the breakout rooms, the discussion, questions, anything still that you're... Um... I do have another question. Yeah, no, no, please. All right. um, do you use... One concern that I have that I have as a communication teacher is the amount of disinformation around the topic, right? Do you use those five questions for fact-checking? Because I see those five questions very good for uh, looking at the biases. I use different questions for fact-checking, but I'm just curious if you use this framework of five questions for them to fact-check. Thank you for that question, because that separates the news literacy from the media literacy. And because I'm teaching media literacy, I'm focusing on the cultural perspective and on the way that uh, people interpret and the power that is happening there. The fact checking comes when we start to do, because the way I do it, and again, I'm talking about undergrad and graduate students. So when I do that, but I think you're also teaching undergrad and grad, right? So, so it's relevant for you. What I do is when we start to talk about the author, right in the beginning, I'm like, okay, do you think he's reliable? I'm adding sub questions to that. So it's not just who is the author. It's like, okay, so who is this person? Is it a real or is it fake? And then we're using tools to realize, is it the bot? Or is it like, how do you know it's an actual person? Did you go and check like other publication of this person? And so the fact checking is a sub inherent of this things of like understanding the different perspective, like how another media outlet would depict this topic in a totally different way. So when I have a whole class, I do that as the sub question of it, but the focus is the cultural interpretation to really understand where the power, what are the biases that have been shown and less the emphasis on the fact checking, although it's an inherent part of it. Sounds good, thank you. Sure. Any other sharing? How was it for you to do this? Do you think it's useful for you to use it? Is it something, anything you, you learn or any experience that was interesting to share? I always feel better hearing from others. So it's it's good to be a listener. And I think, you know, giving people the space to, to listen to what others have to say. Um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, behind, you know, my eyes and in, in, in my ears that just hearing someone else share is is helpful. So... Okay. Thank you. And and on purpose, I have the seven seconds awkward silence because I'm not one of those teachers who say any question. Okay, let's move on. So the awkwardness I'm always telling my students is on purpose to really open the space for people to feel that they are welcome to, to share. I think for, for, for me as an adult who's not in a classroom it was really important for me to read the comments uh or to read some of the comments uh to the cartoon because i'm i feel like i'm very isolated so it it kind of got me in, in a room to listen mm -hmm. to what other people were saying but i can also see if i was to read those questions in a classroom Yanti, you you said you have to truncate it. You have to say, okay, you know, one minute and that's it. Move on. I mean, but also very important what I do, I use, I'm a PowerPoint addict, but what I do is I take a screenshot. And as I said, I curate, especially mm -hmm. when you're talking about high school, I wouldn't just go and start scrolling and whatever you find, because that's an openness to a lot of things that can happen that you don't have control over. So by curating, and I'm sometimes curating things that are problematic and I disagree with, but I at least know like and prepare myself to um, address students' questions. Um,
Okay, that was seven in my count, but um, so I want to end with a positive note, which is very difficult. And I found um, NAS as being really inspiring in a, such a difficult time. And so I'm gonna share with you this four minute video that is very difficult and there is some triggers there. So I'm warning already, but I think what's important when we're talking about atrocities and we're talking about such difficult thing to also close with something that give us hope. Because at the end of the day, and again, from my personal skewed experience, there's a lot of people on Palestinian side and on the Israeli side who are working for peace. There are grieving mothers who are meeting on a weekly basis that are uh, trying to bring peace. They're not the majority, but they're still voices for peace and for humanities. And so I want to finish with a hopeful message that we can, with all this horrible thing that is happening, and it's been happening for a long time, um, can finish with something to see that there is some hope. So. I'll share with you the video and we can again talk about it later with we're already beyond time so i appreciate you coming but i really it's important for me to finish with this video it's four minutes and 17 seconds uh so i'll share now hopefully you can hear the sound and see it um tell me if you don't hear the sound hey guys um it's it's hard uh i'm not gonna lie Every Thursday, I'm supposed to do a company update, but this week, I didn't work at all. Uh, I was too sad. Instead, today, I want to introduce you to my partner, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex. See, Alex is the COO of NAS company, and I am the CEO. He's Muslim, I'm Jewish and we've worked together for more than 1,000 days. Together, we built a company that hired Palestinians and Israelis and a hundred other people. A company that builds products to make the world better. But this week, our relationship was tested by this. <laughs> Every moment that I was not thinking about work, I just felt that I wanted to cry, if I'm honest. Really? Yeah. And um, just so many lies. Did you cry? I did, yeah. I cried many times. Many times? Yeah. Um, just so many people's lives destroyed. So many kids that I've just either killed or kidnapped. And What's happened will, you know, destroy people's lives forever. The world has turned upside down. It turned into Jew versus Muslim, Muslim versus Jew. Muslims siding with Palestine and Jews siding with Israel. And that's all very hard to see. And that's why we are here to show you that Jews and Muslims are more similar than they are different. When we partner, we can achieve so much. We can build instead of destroy. We can create jobs instead of take lives. In reality, Jews and Muslims, our lives are like this. There are two million Muslims who live inside Israel. Even the Israeli army has many Muslims in it. In reality, many Muslims are against what Hamas did and they cannot stand behind it. And in reality, many Jews like me want peace and dignity for Palestinians. Don't let the recent events confuse you. What we are seeing is a proxy war, a political conflict, what we are seeing is extremism and we cannot let it win. Not Palestinian extremism or Israeli one. And this really what boggles me. What people don't know is how similar we are. It's like on the internet, it looks like you are, you are something and I'm something completely different, but our cultures are the same. There are so many Arab Jews. There are so many Muslims in Israel. There's so many like uh, similar traditions. So if you're feeling helpless, don't. 
This is the time to continue the fight. Today, we commit to a thousand more days of working together. And I hope you commit to a thousand more days of promoting tolerance and uniting people. It's your job, his job, and my job to commit to bring people together no matter how difficult it gets. Let's get to work, bro. Let's do it. Let's go. So obviously this is like a PSA of his company and what he's doing and we can analyze it for hours and I'll put here the link and you can see some of the interesting comments of different people that are taking it in different ways. Uh, we're not going to delve into that. I want to thank all of you to coming to this webinar and I appreciate you, uh, you know, uh, giving me feedback, uh, being in touch, and uh, let me know if you have questions, if you need any help, and this recording will be posted and all the resources on uh, the webpage of uh, today's um, um, webinar, which I'm putting here in the chat. Um, so again, thank you so much. Thank you.